Hey, good morning once again, everyone. Good morning. Wow, worship team left me lots of time here. Look at that. But it feels like we, we sung some very nice songs. I think the Lord makes the sun stand still for me. It gives me time to get things done that I need to do. Friends, today we want to continue on with our look at prayer. What an amazing privilege prayer is. Last week we had a sermon on prayer. This week, one more. Prayer is a huge topic, and it's a hugely important topic. So in two sermons, we have not said the last word on prayer, obviously. But for this hour, I want to give us what I think we need to hear, to be reminded of, to encourage our hearts to pray. Just by way of review, remember that prayer is an essential, indispensable part of the Christian life, isn't it? You can't really walk a Christian life that's profitable, fruitful, God-honoring, really not maximally, without prayer. How could you do it? The Lord Jesus Christ, in the days of his earthly ministry, was a man of prayer. He prayed. He prayed when he came into the world. He prayed at his baptism, at the beginning of his public ministry. He prayed. He prayed all through his ministry. He went to lonely places to pray. He prayed through the night. And at the end of his life, he was found praying, praying for his murderers. In his final words, he breathed out a prayer. Into your hands I commit my spirit, he said to his father. He gave his spirit leave. And now raised to glory and sitting at the right hand of the majesty on high, we are assured that he's still praying. <laughs> Hebrews, the seventh chapter, says he ever lives now to make intercession for the saints. That's amazing. He's a man of prayer. We should be people of prayer. It was the Puritan Thomas Watson who said that prayer is the soul's breathing. I like that. Prayer is the soul's breathing. Of course, you need to breathe physically to stay alive, to stay alive physically, and you need to pray to find spiritual life, don't you? I mean, the beginning of our born-again experience, the beginning of it involved prayer. Didn't it? You had to call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. There is salvation in no other but Jesus. Whoever calls upon his name will be saved. Now, both Testaments insist upon that. Your born-again experience in this life begins with prayer, heartfelt, legitimate prayer to God. Well, people have all kinds of excuses for not praying. How about this one? I have no time. Really? (laughs) we live like kings in the western world we have more free time luxuries, entertainments than ever before than ever before in human history the person who says to me I have no time to pray I want to look at your life I'll bet you do I bet you could probably put your phone down for five minutes and talk to God or whatever whatever it is that's occupying your time I I bet you can sacrifice a little bit of something to talk to God. Don't tell me there's no time. I mean, I am the busiest person I know, let me tell you. From the moment my eyes creak open to the time they slam shut at night, I am busy. And even I can find time to pray, talk to God. Your prayers don't have to be long, flowery speeches. Just talk to God throughout the day for all the things you're doing. I learned that lesson a long time ago. Whatever I'm doing, I, I try to involve God. Help me, God. I remember working at Standard Arrow. I think I've said, told you this story. Working at Standard Arrow. This aerospace industry, very complicated. <laughs> Not easy. I mean, your brain has to be on. And uh, when I started working there, that's not just working in a lumber mill for eight hours, doing some mindless thing on a chop saw. This is, you gotta put your brain to work. And I was very intimidated by that job. I involved Jesus in everything I was doing. Oh, Lord, help me. Don't let me mess this up. I, I, this is important. And he really came through for me. And he helped me. And my boss commended me one time. He said, you're really doing a good job. I said, well, praise God. Praise God for helping me. And she said, why don't you just take some credit? <laughs> and uh, I witnessed to her. And she got saved. She found the Lord. Because she, I, I, part of the testimony was that God is not far away. He's as close as your prayers. And he answers. Don't tell me you don't have time. You have time. Some people don't pray because 
Their lack of prayer is just an expression of a lack of humility. They're like that first king of Israel, Saul, who turned out to be an abject failure. He was a proud person. He decided he didn't really need to consult God on big things or little things. And the moment he started thinking like that, the first domino fell, and he began to slide away from God, and he never recovered. He was too proud. He didn't need God's help. He thought, well, we all need God's help. I mean, that's wisdom. Realize that we can't do anything without God's help, enablement. We need him, moment by moment. Some people don't pray because they just don't have faith. They don't really believe that God is listening. Uh, Or they have a low view of God that he really can't help them. So what's the point? Lack of faith. And some people are just going to be plain disobedient. They they know what God tells them, and they're just not going to do it. That's called disobedience. Romans 12.12 says that you and I are to continue steadfastly in prayer. Steadfastly in prayer. Like, this is when I pray, and I'm not going to be dissuaded from that. I'm not going to be manipulated or pushed off of this. I'm going to pray. I'm going to talk to my God now. This is is when I pray. And I'm going to pray throughout the day. I'm not going to be discouraged from this. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 Paul says, pray without ceasing. Without ceasing. It doesn't mean you walk around for 24 hours with words coming out of your mouth praying, obviously, but he's saying as a basic lifestyle choice, you are a man or a woman of prayer. Your day is filled with prayers to God. Long ones, short ones, but prayers to God. Ephesians 6.18 says we are to pray always. Always prayer. And friends, we have scriptural encouragement, don't we? We talked about this last week. The greatest revelational and redemptive events in history, in the history of the world, were preceded with fervent, heartfelt, believing prayer. We went through some of that, didn't we? Many examples. In fact, James chapter 5 calls to mind one of the greatest heroes of the Old Testament. His name, Elijah. I believe you will see Elijah on the earth before the end of the world. Jesus said, Elijah must come first and restore all things. Elijah's coming. Him and Moses were seen on the Mount of Transfiguration, remember, during the earthly ministry of Jesus? Elijah must come. Elijah is a very special person, isn't he, in the Bible? But James chapter 5 absolutely insists that James, or that Elijah rather, Elijah was a man like us. He was a human being with a human nature. He had frailties as we have frailties. He wasn't Superman. Elijah was not Superman. He's a man, a normal man like us, subject to like passions. Elijah knew what depression was. Elijah got very depressed. He knew knew what fearfulness was. He got fearful. He got intimidated. Yet he's one of the greatest heroes in Bible history. In fact, Elijah wanted to wanted to say to God, I quit. I just want to die now. Can I just die and quit this job you've given me? You know what God said? No. (laughs) No, you're not not going to die and you're not going to quit. Get a little rest, have some food to eat, and get going. Get back in the fight. I think it was Pastor Gilbert reminded me, someone said, uh, when you throw in the towel, God throws it back. (laughs) He says, wipe your face and get going. (laughs) And that's Elijah. But we're told in Ephesians, James 5.16, it's James. He said, uh, Elijah prayed, and God heard, and God shut up the heavens for three and a half years, no rain. And then Elijah prayed again, and the heavens were opened, and the rains descended upon the earth. I mean, God changed the weather for that man, a man like, like we are, people like we are. Many, many examples of fervent, heartfelt, Believing prayer availing much. The fervent, effectual prayer of a righteous man avails much. That's what the Bible says. Prayer matters. Of course, the ultimate example is the Lord Jesus himself who prayed. And amazing things happened when Jesus prayed. Prayed to his Father. And amazing things happened. He made the world savable through prayer. I mean, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He made them savable. Father, forgive them. The Bible says that if we say we abide in Jesus, we're supposed to walk as he walked. He was a man of prayer. We need to be people of prayer. 
Last week we talked about that and we talked about some barriers to answered prayer. You ever pray and nothing happened? <coughs> nothing really happened. Well, James explains why, why this is sometimes. Sometimes we pray with wrong motives. You can't really pray selfish prayers. You don't go and blow your paycheck on lottery tickets and then say, well, God, please let me win big this time around. Do you think he's going to answer that kind of prayer? Why don't you be responsible? Why don't you be a good steward of the resources he gave you? You don't waste, you don't act irresponsibly, waste the resources God put into your hand, do something dumb and irresponsible, and then expect God to bail you out. No. Or dumb little prayers. Remember, I think I last week said, Oh God, just answer my prayer and give me that Lamborghini because I want to look so cool in front of you. <laughs> That's... James says, don't think you're going to get answers to those kinds of things. James also says, if you're going to pray, pray believing. You have to have faith. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways, James says, and don't think that you'll receive anything that you ask of the Lord. You've got to pray a prayer of, that has belief behind it. You've got to have faith in God. And God has made himself very believable. And then finally, God's not going to answer the prayers of someone who is locked in gross, unrepentant, habitual sin. How about that one? Do you remember the great prophet Isaiah, chapter 1 and chapter 59, where the prophet says, your iniquities have separated you from your God so that he will not hear. God says, I don't care. You can spread out your hands and pray many prayers. I am not listening until we get this sin problem dealt with. Habitual, unrepentant sin. God says, get that dealt with. I mean, you can ask God for help, and he'll help you in those things, but you're going to keep this, your own little private sin, and you have no intentions of repenting of it and getting rid of it, jettisoning that from your life. Don't think that God is going to be very enthused to answer your prayers. God wants us body, soul, and spirit. You want, to say, he, you want God to save you, body, soul, and spirit, so God says, give me everything. Hold nothing back. <coughs> Repent of those secret sins and let him cleanse you of all unrighteousness, and he'll do it. He will do it. Sometimes God says, well, not yet. Not yet. Like Isaac praying for a son. Two decades go by, 20 years before the man has a son. I wonder if his faith started to wane a little bit. Maybe I don't get a son. But you promised God. You made covenant promises to Abraham and his offspring. I mean, I could just imagine the wrestling matches he was having with God. And God, but God made good on his promises, and Isaac had a son. Sometimes God is saying, not yet. Sometimes he says, my grace is sufficient. Remember 2 Corinthians 12? Paul said, oh God, take this from me. I am dealing with something really hard right now. Paul called it a thorn in his flesh. All kinds of debate on what that is. For our purposes this morning, it doesn't matter. All we know is it was a hard thing. Paul prayed three times earnestly, God, get rid of this. God says, for the moment, I won't. You're going to learn my grace is sufficient. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. So sometimes God says, no, I'm not answering that right now. You're going to learn something. You're going to grow from this. I'm going to display my power to the world in your weakness. You're going to be strong in me, and you're going to accomplish some things despite the things you're dealing with right now, the hard things. Yes, they should crush other people. That Yes, these things should crush you, but you're not crushed. That's a witness to the world, that I'm at work, I'm real, and I'm working in you. See? I mean, God is so wise. He knows how to do this. We just say, Lord, help us get on the same wavelength with you. Help us to agree with you. Help us to not kick against your good plans and purposes. I mean, that's part of prayer too. Lord, make the changes in me that need to get made. And there are lots that need to be made in me personally. And I'm the one entrusted with opening the Bible to people. But I think I'm not alone in this. We were talking last time about praying in Jesus' name. Remember that? You pray, Jesus said, pray in my name, I'll give you anything you want. And we said, well, that can't be right. I've prayed many things, and I've said, in Jesus' name, and it didn't happen. And we know that God isn't lying to us, so we must be misunderstanding something here. Right? One thing we have to agree on is the phrase, in Jesus' name, is not a magic 
word. It's not a magic formula. It's not abracadabra. You don't pray for anything under the sun and then say, in Jesus' name, and expect it to happen unconditionally. No. We remember that you, you and I are collectively the body and bride of Jesus. We are his bride. We are his wife. And we remember that in the ancient world and in the modern world, wives could transact and conduct business in their husband's names, and they would do those things for their husband's benefit. That's exercising authority in your husband's name. Praying in Jesus' name means that we are pursuing our Lord's plans, goals, desires, and intentions. We say, Lord, I pray for such and such in Jesus' name to advance His agenda for His blessedness, for His honor and glory, for the advancement of His kingdom. That's what we mean by praying in His name. And you and I don't always know what His will is, do we? It's kind of hard. Praying in His name is synonymous with praying according to His will in 1 John 5. In Ephesians 6, it's called praying in the Spirit. These are all synonyms. Praying in the Spirit. The Spirit moving us to pray. Praying according to His will. Praying in His name. We don't always know. In Romans, the 8th chapter, Paul says, We know not what we should pray for as we ought. Understatement. There's lots of things I want. I don't know if they're the best things. Paul says, God's got you covered there too, dear child. The Spirit himself makes intercession with us, uh, for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. I've been so shattered in my life, and you have too, I'm sure, that you can't even manage words when you're trying to pray. I've been there. And I say, thank you, God, there's a Holy Spirit now at work. He's interceding for me. I can't quite manage words, but he can. And he speaks your language, dear Father. Thank you for this grace also. I mean, that is a God worth worshiping, don't you think? He is so kind to us. He says, you need prayer, and I'll answer those prayers, but you can't manage it, so I'll pray for you. How do you like that? Has there ever been a God in the history of world religion that operates like the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Never. Never a God who's so close to his people as our God is. Let's look, please, at Matthew 6. I just want to quickly look at this model prayer that the Lord gave us to pray. It's not a mantra. We don't mindlessly chant this Lord's Prayer, as some people are in the habit of doing. This is a model prayer. These are things we should be talking to God about. You use your own words. If you can't manage them, it should be okay to pray this prayer. You could use the exact words straight out of the Bible, as long as you are really conscious about what you're saying, and that you don't just check out and start thinking about football or something, right? You want to be thinking about who you're talking to and the meaning of the words that you're saying. Matthew 6, verse 5. We'll start in verse 5. Jesus said, When you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. Our prayers are directed to God, and everything else in the world, in the created order, under the sun, can just go into the shadows for a few minutes. It's us and God now. And we don't really, we're not praying to make a big show here. Verse 6. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut the door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. In this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. That is the model prayer. I'd like us to take a few minutes and, and contemplate some of the beautiful things that are there in that prayer that we should focus on and rejoice in. First of all, Jesus says our prayers are directed to our Father. Note that. Who is this person we call our Father? He is the King of Eternity. He's the uncreated God of gods. He is absolutely infinite in all his perfections. He is mysterious. He's awesome. 
In fact, in some ways, he's terrifying for his magnitude, his infinitude. And that God absolutely possesses the supreme right to be believed and obeyed. And whatever he asks us to call him, that we do without question. He could have said, you address me and you say, your highness, your holiness, or some other, some other title. But as a matter of fact, God says, you call me father. In fact, Jesus says, when you pray, you say, our father. Hey, don't forget, you're part of a redeemed family. It's not just you and God. You're part of a whole group now connected by a common faith and a common spirit. Our Father. Now that changes things. We're not dealing with a, with a despot here. A senseless despot whose main attribute is just raw self-determination. No, the Bible says God is love. And God says, you call me Father now. And Jesus is your elder brother. And he's the heir of all things. And you're joint heirs with him. And you call me Father. Our Father, which art in heaven... Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be your name. Our first, peti- our first petition to God, number one. God, be glorified in this world. Be glorified. Set your name apart as special and unique. You know, Peter the Apostle was hearing this, wasn't he? He said, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Set him apart as special. God's voice is not just one of many voices in the world. God gets a special place in our heart of hearts, a special, unique, privileged place where his word carries its own credentials. He possesses the right to be believed and obeyed without without question. We don't test him. We don't try him. We just believe him, obey him. He gets the special, privileged, privileged position. That's hallowing his name in our heart of hearts. You know, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And when we pray this prayer, we're saying, God, help me to move in that direction. Help us to be people who actually want to glorify you in everything. The second petition is that God's kingdom would come. Your kingdom come. What's that mean? That means God, exercise your supreme authority on this earth the way you do in heaven. Subdue and cast out your enemies, all things that offend on this wretched earth. Cast them out of here reign and rule and usher in the promised kingdom with all its attending blessings. Please come, just come back. In the person of your beloved son Jesus, come back. Sit on the throne of your father David and reign and rule over a restored created order. Please come. We've gotten the message, God. Man cannot govern himself. It's a three-ring circus. Every time I watch question and answer period in the parliament there in the House of Commons, what is going on? These are the people that are leading the country? I can't believe we've lasted this long. (laughs) <laughs> we, we cannot govern ourselves Lord Jesus come back in fact start right now take ground for the kingdom in me take more of my heart take more of my mind make more of my intentions your intentions just chip away at all that remains of me until there's just you God would you do it in me first And that leads to the third petition. Your will be done, God. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That sort of entails that God's will is not being done on earth as it is in heaven. It's going to happen one day, maximally, in spectacular fashion, when Jesus Christ tears the sky wide open and he comes back in power and glory and dignity. And he ascends to the throne of his father David and subdues all things to himself. But even now in this world, the kingdom takes territory with every soul that is saved, with every person who cries out to Jesus for salvation and receives it. More territory is surrendered to the Lordship of Christ. And the kingdom expands as God's will is done in the hearts and minds and homes of these new converts. It's already coming. It's already here in some way. We pray, Lord, your will be done. I want your will done here. And that leads us to a little meditation on what God's will actually is. We say we want your will done, but have we read the Bible to discern what God's will actually is? A lot of people ask me, how do I discern God's will? I say, well, read the Bible (laughs) to start with, to start with. Because God lets you know what his will is. 
I'm reading now from 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter. Paul says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification. It's God's will that you're different from the rest of this wicked world. That's God's will, right there. Your sanctification, and then he gives you a little detail. Ready for this one? That you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. This world you and I live in right now, particularly the Western world, is super saturated in sexual deviance, sexual promiscuity, sexual perversion. I mean, God put a drive in people to get together and procreate and and to enjoy the sex act. That's in us. And God says, I gave that to you. That's a gift. But you must confine that to the marriage covenant relationship, and and that's where it belongs. And the world says, in effect, we will not submit to that. We're going to do every kind of perverse thing we decide to do in pursuit of our pleasures. It's another Sodom and Gomorrah. In fact, Billy Graham once said, if God doesn't judge the Western world, he owes Sodom and Gomorrah an apology. Really. God says, this is what I want from you. You look different than the rest of them out there. I remember working at Standard Arrow, I had uh, one of the employees said, hey, it's Thursday, John. We're all going to the stripper bar. You want to come? I said, no, I don't think so. Oh, come on. You know, they tried to... And I know they were trying to persuade me to go with them so that later on they can say, you hypocrite, aren't you a Christian? I'm on to these guys. I said, forget it. First of all, I'm married. Second of all, so are you. <laughs> and that man just shut his lips right there and walked away. You're, aren't you married? Yeah. Possess your own vessel in sanctification and honor. Get control of yourself. We're not animals, we're men. You're not pushed around by your desires, by your hormones. You can make a choice. You're a born again man, make a choice. You're in charge. Your born again spiritual nature is in charge. That's why fasting is important from time to time. You tell your cravings and desires, I'm in charge. We're going to forego a meal today and we're going to pray. That's how that's going to work. It's a good idea to teach your flesh who's in charge. See? And that's pleasing to God. In John, the 17th chapter, Jesus prayed a prayer for his followers. And that prayer reaches out to us, too. We're, We're people who believe the apostolic witness. And he prayed specifically for us. And he prayed that we would be sanctified by the word and truth. God's word is truth, he said. He said, I want you to be different, set apart as holy, and your commitment to the word of God will be the thing that does it. Because in all the world, we are the custodians of the life-saving New Testament witness. And if we really believe it, and we order our conduct in accordance with this, we will be different. We are going to stand out like a sore thumb, is what's going to happen. But that's what God wants. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Prove what is that will of God. Investigate, ascertain, explore, search the scriptures daily so that you know what is pleasing to God and then you strive to live up to those inspired standards that reflect God's heart on the matter. See? You can't do that on your own strength. I know I can't. We can ask God for some help, but God says you're sanctified by the Word. In other words, you believe the Word, you know what it says, you know what you're called to do, now get to it. And you'll be different. You'll be set apart. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. In everything give thanks. Is that easy to do? I don't think so. We're not thanking God for every horrible thing that happens, but when we're experiencing those horrible things, we still thank God for his promises. The horrible thing will pass. It won't go on forever. And God has wonderful things promised there. He's promised us for the future. And you can encourage yourself. You can thank God. You can still find reasons to thank God, even in horrible things, in horrible situations. The fourth petition is to have God meet our needs. We say, God, give us this day our daily bread. Meet my needs, please, God. And, and meet, give me my daily bread. You're going to be like the writer to the proverb who says, God, don't give me way too much. 
because I might forget you. I might think I'm self-sufficient, so don't give me too much. And God, don't give me too little because I might have to go out and steal. And then I, I, give, I blaspheme your name when I'm doing that. I, I, I cast you in a bad light. The world thinks that you don't provide or that your people are weak. Lord, just give me what I need every day, please. Keep me, keep me safe. Keep me provided for. And that kind of prayer is confession of continual dependence on God, which we are. And that's an expression of humility. And the Bible says that God, he resists the proud. I don't want to be resisted by God. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. He will exalt you in due time, the Bible says. In due time, it'll happen. In fact, Proverbs 15.33 says that before honor is humility. Before honor is humility. Maximally exemplified in the ministry of Jesus, by the way. Jesus was humble, meek, gentle. He allowed himself to be taken with wicked hands, crucified and slain. I mean, you can't get more humble and submissive than that. Humble right to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him the name above every name. Every knee bows, every tongue confesses Jesus Christ is Lord. He is now maximally glorified with all authority in heaven and earth given to him. But humility came first. God says, walk in, walk in Christ's footsteps. Humility comes first. And then number five, we confess our guilt. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. We need constant forgiveness. I do. Remember one theologian said, you know, I think about a million thoughts a day. I really can't say every thought was the best thought for that moment. You know, I suspect that I have a lot of sinful thoughts. In fact, I know I do. I really can't say that every thought I've ever had in the last 24 hours has been beautiful and pure and God-honoring. Or the words that come out of my mouth. Or the actions that I take. I say, God, I am going to confess right now that I need your forgiveness. In fact, the Bible says in 1 John 1.8, if you say you're without sin, you deceive yourself. The truth is not in you. But if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive and to cleanse of all unrighteousness. Not some unrighteousness, all of it. He'll cleanse you of all unrighteousness. But you have to confess to him. And that's not easy. It's kind of hard, isn't it? You have to verbalize to God the terrible thing you did, the thing you're ashamed of. God says, do it. And I'll take care of it. Just do it. I think of Daniel, the ninth chapter. Fantastic amazing, essential, end times prophecy in Daniel 9, preceded with confession. We're all guilty, God help me. Help us. We're guilty. He says, don't lead us into temptation. Help us, God, in our pursuit of holiness. Can't do it without you. In other words, it's a recognition and confession of human weakness and frailty and our proneness to error and sin. It's saying to God, lead me because if you don't, I'm going to wander into disaster. I mean, that's what I say. God, don't let me wreck the good things. I say, God, don't let me wreck the good things that you're doing in this church. Lord, I'm trusting you that your ability to keep things on the good and right path is greater than my ability to wreck it. I pray prayers like that often. Deliver us from the evil one, he says. Just give us supernatural protection. God says, you'll have it. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. First John 5 says, that evil one does not touch you. And Paul says in Romans 16, 20, the day is coming, dear saints, where you will crush that old serpent, the devil and Satan, under your feet shortly. That's coming. How does that look? I'm not sure. But he is mankind's greatest and most feared enemy. And God says he'll crush that serpent under your feet. I take that as a reference to our closeness to Jesus which is what I'm going to end with. We're so close to our God and Redeemer, closer than we could ever be to each other. His victories are our victories. He crushes Satan, we crush Satan. Think about the end of the prayer. Yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. God, those things belong to you. Yours is the kingdom, that's authority. Yours is the power, the might, the strength, the ability to do something and get something done around here. And yours is the glory, the majesty, the dignity, the honor, the praiseworthiness. It all belongs to you, God. It all belongs to you. And the amazing thing here is, 
That's true, but he shares it with you. I can hardly believe it, but this is what the Bible says. He said, yours is the kingdom. You know what Jesus said to his, his followers, his believers, his disciples? In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, verse 32, he said, Do not fear, little flock. It's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Little flock. Isn't that tender? The Good Shepherd says, Don't be afraid, little flock. It's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. It's His kingdom, but it's yours in Christ. That's amazing. In the book of Revelation, chapter 1, and chapter 5, it says that Christ's believers, members of his body and bride, they will reign on the earth as kings and priests, a nation of kings and priests in Jesus, new covenant priests, a nation of kings. Yours is the kingdom, but it's ours also in you, Jesus. And yours is the power, and it's ours also. Paul says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Paul says, in his inspired prayer, that we are to be strengthened with all might according to his glorious power. Ephesians 2 calls it resurrection power. Resurrection power. Paul would have our eyes open to the exceeding greatness of God's power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power which we worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. We have all that is necessary to live victorious lives, to do everything we're called to do. God's given it to us. The world wants to brainwash us out of that, wants us to feel like we don't amount to too much. Well, it's God's opinion is the one that matters here. And he says, dear child, I've given you everything you need to do what I've called you to do. We either believe it or we don't. The last thing we say in the prayer is, yours is the glory forever. And this is a big one for me. God says, I don't share my glory with anyone else. My glory I don't give to another. And yet Jesus prayed, Father, the glory you gave me, I've given them. That's kind of mysterious. Romans chapter 8 says that those that God foreknew, he predestined, and those he predestined, he called, and those he called, he justified, and those he justified, he glorified. He glorified these people. 1 Thessalonians Chapter 2, beginning in verse 12. Listen to this now. I'll start in verse 11. As you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his own children, that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. We're going to share Christ's glory with him. In fact, Roman, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 5 Paul insists that every man in Christ will have his praise of God. Yes, God doesn't share his glory with another, but you and I are in Christ. We're so closely associated with Christ that he glorifies us. We are the sons and daughters of light, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know this, that when he appears, we will see him as he is, and we will be like him, the Bible says. The Bible insists on it. God has begun a good work in all of us and he will perform it. At 6 o'clock tonight, we start praying. We go for 24 hours. And as we do this, I want you to remember something. Romans chapter 8. Paul says, Our God did not spare his son, but delivered him up for us all. How will he not with him also freely give us all things? Think about it. Is God going to withhold any good thing from you? He's already given his son for you and me. Wow. Thank you, God. Let's pray. Dear blessed and holy God, we're so grateful that you love us. Thank you for confronting us with your precious word that gives us patience, comfort, and hope for this hour. Lord, seal these truths into our hearts and may we call upon them when we need to to do all that we're called to do in this world for your honor and glory. And we pray it in Jesus' precious and beautiful name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. And God bless you all, dear saints.